might have noticed that it's not Avi. It's not a coup or anything. Avi is off in Europe giving a talk at a conference. So he asked me to take over in his place. Uh, so in fact, I thought there were two empty seats there, but in fact, John is sitting in one of our seats. That my twin brother and I usually occupy. <laughs> so as usual, we will have hope. I am supposed to wear a crown. <laughs> so that you will really realize that I am in charge. <laughs> so as usual, we'll have four presentations. So I'll read out the details. Uh, first, we'll hear from Victor Buza. New constraints on gravitational waves from Planck, WMAP, and BICEP2 slash Keck observations. Then our ITC colloquium speaker. Dan Foreman Mackey, who gave a very interesting talk on algorithms and open source software, etc. Just now, he's going to tell us about Hamiltonian Monte Carlo methods for astronomers. Then our CFA colloquium speaker. Ah, there's Rafaela. Yeah. So Rafaela Malguti from Northwestern, but of course we all know her as a CFA person. So she will talk talk about superluminous supernovae two extremes of the electromagnetic spectrum. And finally, Grant Tremblay, yes, Grant, yeah, from the Equity and Inclusion Journal Club, I believe, he's going to talk about why the GRE is not a good thing, select for the wrong thing. So very interesting slate. So let me invite Victor to get started. Does this work? OK. Uh, yeah, hi everybody. My name is Victor Buza. I'm a graduate student here with John Kovac, and today I'll be presenting on behalf of the Bicep Keck collaboration. And I'll be talking about our newest results, which have hit the archive a few weeks ago and are going to be the PRL editor's choice uh, of the month, basically this month. Uh, so most of you have heard a Bicep Keck talk at some point here, uh, but for those of you who haven't, I'll take a couple of minutes to basically tell you what we do and, and, and why we do it. So Bicep Keck is a series of experiments at the South Pole that are measuring the cosmic microwave background. In particular, we're measuring the polarization of the CMB. Uh, so if you look at this history of the universe plot, the CMB is right here. Before it, the universe was really dense and hot and ionized and light couldn't free stream to us, and then at some point the universe cooled enough and expanded enough that neutral hydrogen could form and photons could finally free stream. And this particular boundary is called either the cosmic microwave background or the surface of lot scattering, and it is polarized. And in particular, there are two types of polarization effects on it that come from two different types of waves that occur from basically quantum fluctuations at the beginning of the of the beginning of the universe being exponentially expanded. And so you get scalar perturbations or perturbations to the scalar field. They create these, uh, these density waves and trace all the matter in the universe currently. And then you also get uh, perturbations to the metric. And these are called tensor perturbations. And they're effectively primordial gravitational waves. And the, these two have very different effects, they have very different polarization patterns on the cosmic microwave background. They have very different uh, symmetries, and so they create very different quadrupolar polarization patterns. In particular, they can be decomposed roughly in a uh, curl-free and grad-free basis uh, of, of, the pol of the polarization. And they two, the, the, these two trace the, uh, as I said, the scalar and tensor perturbations, and they trace the amplitude of these, and the ratio of these is called the tensor to scalar ratio, and it's parameterized as R. Um, so, Bicep Keck is trying to detect R, and a detection of R basically would, would give us a window into the primordial universe right here, which would be able to say something directly about the energy scale at the, at the beginning of the universe, and we'd also be able to say something about perhaps the quantum nature of gravity. So, it's a, it's a really exciting and unique opportunity, uh, and a unique window into the universe that we're trying to access here. I'm not the only one who, who thinks so. In particular, the Bicep Keck collaboration has members across many different institutions, and we have a lot of people locally here at Harvard, uh, where John Kovac is, is the PI. So with Bicep Keck, over the years, we've tried uh, to build significant, uh, more and increasingly more and more powerful instruments, starting with Bicep 2, and then with Keck, which was five times more powerful, Bicep 3, which in one tube basically does everything 
cactus, and then we're currently in the process of building bicep array, which is going to be deployed starting this year. And, and we've, we're targeting this two degree peak that basically is the peak of the of a possible primordial gravitation, gravitational wave signal. And we're observing from the South Pole, which allows us to observe a part of the sky uh, continuously. So we can get really, really deep maps. In addition to multiple different instruments, we're also observing at different frequencies. In particular, that's important if we want to decouple a gravitational wave signal from uh, galactic contaminants, such as synchrotron and dust. So far, so I, I'll be presenting on data at three different frequencies, 95, 150, and 220 gigahertz. Uh, and these are the particular typical responses that we have from our detectors. And, uh, but in, in general, for instance, bicep array uh, is going to detect, it, is going to observe at even more frequencies. Uh, then basically what we do is we accumulate data at these three different frequencies and we create these maps. And here we have the intensity and then the Q and U Stokes parameter polarization signals uh, of, of our observed polarization. So this is the signal and this is the noise which integrates with time. And uh, we have these maps now at three different frequencies and I'll flip between them and you can see that the structure of the signal stays roughly the same. Which is, you, which is what you'd expect for the CMB, uh, save for maybe beam effects, and then also the, the, and, and, and the different levels of noise, which are basically uh, proportional to basically the integration time that we've done at these three different frequencies. So if you, you can even look at the intensity one, you can see that it traces structure really well. And these maps right here are the deepest ever polarization maps uh, of the CMB that have been, have been made. We've continuously published these depolarization maps. Uh, these ones are currently uh, our deepest ones. So then we take these, we take these three different maps and we take also maps uh, from Planck and WMAP which have maps over the entire sky and they're also polarized and we take them at very different frequencies in particular because it allows us to get a handle on synchrotron at the lowest frequencies and a, on thermal emission from dust, which is also polarized at these high frequencies. We also take data from, from WMAP. So then we take all of these maps and then we form either, uh, we correlate them with themselves, so we form auto spectra that trace basically power at different multiples, uh, or we cross correlate them with each other and so we form what people call cross spectra, so cross power spectra. And in particular, we have a lot of these maps and so we get a lot of different auto and, and cross-power spectrum, and it's not really important to stare at each one of them individually. The idea is that we have uh, many band powers from which, to, uh, from which to analyze this particular data set. And so then the problem becomes how to take all of this data and be able to tease out uh, galactic dust, synchrotron, possible primordial gravitational waves from this entire, uh, from this entire wall, of, uh, wall of spectra. So this is something I've spent uh, a lot of my graduate career on and something uh, I've led. And in particular, we've built this uh, multi-component likelihood analysis uh, model that basically takes all of those spectra, both for B modes and E modes, uh, and then looks for a possible R signal, a number of different uh, foregrounds, which are, our model is basically dust plus, plus synchrotron. And then there's an additional component here, which is basically the CMB lensing as, if, as e modes travel from the primordial universe to us, they get lensed by a uh, structure in the universe, and so they, some of them get lensed into B modes. And people call this the B mode lensing power. And so we have all of these components, uh, all of these parameters that we're, trying to, that we're trying to fit for, and all of, so these are the representation of our frequency coverage for these different, uh, for these different components. And then we have some, these seven parameters are basically the amplitudes of dust and synchrotron defined at these uh, frequency pivots. And then uh, dust is parameterized as a gray body, modified gray body, uh, and synchrotron is a power law, and so we have piv pivots in frequency. Uh, we also have pivots in uh, multiple space that allow us to, to change how these spectra behave. And then finally, we have a possible correlated component between dust and synchrotron, which if you imagine that 
uh, both of them somehow align with the magnetic field of the galaxy, then you, uh, you get a correlated component between the two. Uh, this, we have, so I say seven parameters here, but we have a lot more. Some of them are fixed. Some of them have particular very tight priors on them coming from Planck. And over the years, we've talked to uh, both local and external experts like Doug Finkbeiner and Alex Lazarian to basically uh, make sure that we stay up to date with the current dust physics uh, and dust modeling out there. Uh, also, we've added particular parameters that are not shown here, and I'm not really going to talk about, but it's something that we've had to do to basically make sure that we build a robust framework going forward. And so we've explored effects such as decorrelation of dust across different frequencies that doesn't allow you to just use this template method, uh, or a decorrelation of synchrotron, and so on. So then we, uh, the first application of this framework, and so we take these different, we take all of these different parameters, we take over all of our spectra, and then we basically sample the entire space with uh, MCMCs, and we form uh, n-dimensional likelihoods, then marginalize over all the different parameters, and we form uh, basically marginalized likelihoods on, on the different parameters. This is the first application of this uh, method, and it was in 2015, where it was the original bicep keck Planck analysis. And here in the upper corner, I'll keep pointing at this as basically the marginalized 1D curve on R that shows you uh, what possible gravitational wave signal is there. You can see that it's not a very big parameter space, even though we've explored more with that particular data set, but it's because we had only uh, data at 150 gigahertz at that particular point from bicep keck, which was really the deepest map that we had available. Uh, then subsequently, we introduced data at 95 gigahertz, and we uh, basically uh, extended the parameter space, and now we're able to constrain a lot more foreground <coughs> parameters, and we uh, narrowed down the likelihood on R. Now, finally, we're able to add 220 gigahertz data and more data at 95 and 150, and you get this solid black line, which shows that both the space, uh, both the shape of the likelihood uh, has, has narrowed, and it's shifted <coughs> down a little bit, uh, basically preserving the same zero to peak ratio as it was before. But now we have, uh, the, basically this is the tightest constraint on the tensor to scalar ratio that we have. If we add in new, if we add in information from temperature from Planck, this was basically the first result, the BKP result. Uh, then as subsequently we added B the new 95 gigahertz data and then finally the result currently here, you see that we're constraining this parameter space, which is usually the parameter space that people use to describe different inflationary models and, and basic and, and, and if they fit and if they fit the data and you can see in this particular case something that's really interesting is that we're excluding a lot of monomial model basically all of the monomial models uh, in particular <coughs> phi the phi model is now excluded which uh, was sort of the original model for axion monodromy postulated. So we're, we're really constraining this inflationary space. And as we're going forward, we're building these more and more uh, sensitive instruments. And we're effectively, uh, if you focus on this particular curve, which um, traces the, constraint, the constraining power on R with, uh, with our instruments, we'll be able to get to really, really tight uh, constraints. And as we remove some of this uh, lensing power with what people call de-lensing in the field, where you're able to undeflect your CMB photons and remove some of that lensing contamination, uh, where you need high-resolution data, and we have that data available from the South Pole Telescope, we'll be able to get to roughly 2 to 3, 10 to the minus 3 in sigma r. So we're, we'll be able to start detecting. So if you focus on the, on the red contours, the, so the blue contours are an, an older version of the contours I just showed you uh, before the new Planck data became available. Uh, but you can see uh, that with the data by the end of 2023 with bicep CAC and with uh, de-lensing on the SPT3G, we'll be able to really, really narrow down the space and be able to exclude, for instance, natural inflation, which, uh, which tells us, which is a, offers an explanation for the value of N sub S that is currently being observed. Uh, we would be able to start saying more about the Starobinsky model. Uh, this is, of if, if this is true, of course, the, all the monomial models would be excluded uh, at high significance. And we would be able to detect 
something like r of 0.015 to 3 or 4 sigma, which uh, would, would, would lead to a really high detection, a really high significance for, for, this, particular, uh, for this particular space. So I'm just going to leave you with the conclusion slides here. Effectively, over the years, we've gotten better and better, and we've placed increasingly better constraints on R. Uh, all of our constraints have been world-leading. We currently have the tightest upper limit uh, on R out there, and they're only going to get better. In particular, we have three years of data that's all sitting in the can, and we've been waiting to develop this uh, machinery into something that's really robust, and we're now in the process of analyzing this. So in, in the next year, we'll, we'll get much tighter upper limits already. And then we're working on a first delensing study in the context of a gravita primordial gravitational wave analysis. That's something that's really cool and nobody has done before. And then finally, with bicep array, we expect to get a really extremely uh, good measurements on, on a possible uh, gravitational wave signal. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, at low frequencies, actually, they're very similar. At, so WMAP has data at 23 gigahertz and 33, for instance. And both of those are equally, if not more powerful, than Planck at 30 gigahertz in our region of space. In particular, we're looking at high galactic latitudes, which uh, Planck, for instance, doesn't have very very good very good data sets, yeah. Uh, but, but with Bicep Array, we have our own low frequency receiver that's getting, that's effectively built right now, and it's the first one we will deploy. And it'll be a, a checkerboard between 30 and 40 gigahertz, and that will just be the best data uh, to constrain synchrotron with. In the last two plots that you showed, yep. Oh, so this one is in case there is no signal, there is no R, so R is zero, that's the model, and you are trying to see with what confidence you would be able to say that the 95 upper limit on, on R is. And this one is in case R is a non-zero value, in particular we chose R of 0.015 because we're confident that we would be able to detect that at multiple sigma, yeah. All right, that looks pretty good. Let's see if I can try to break it. Be better. All right, um, so hi everyone, I'm Dan Foreman Mackey, um, and I work in New York City at the Flatiron Institute. And uh, those are my coordinates on the internet. Uh, if anyone uh, would like to chat further, uh, I'd love to talk via email or whatever. Um, so, uh, just before we get started, um, uh, can I just get a show of hands for who has heard of uh, Markov Chain Monte Carlo before? Uh, and how many people have actually used it? Yeah, okay, quite a few people. Now, um, what about uh, something called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo? Who's heard of that? Oh, good, okay, this is good. This is better than when I gave this talk before. Um, and who has used it? Okay, and did any of you publish that? <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, today I wanted to talk a little bit about Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is a method for MCMC. I'll get to that in a second. Um, 
Uh, and this is super new to me. I'm definitely not an expert, but I'll try. And I'll try to give some concrete things that might make it so that you could use HMC for, uh, for your work and maybe even publish it. Um, so, but to start off, I'd like to tell you a little story. And um, since uh, almost everyone in here uses MCMC, I know that you're all good Bayesians. And that means that everything that you care about is this uh, probability distribution here, the posterior probability, which is the probability of some set of parameters given some data. And really, Bayesian data analysis, it, the only thing that you ever do with probability distributions is you do integrals that look like this. So this is really all of science at some level. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we're done, right? Um, now, the problem is there are a few issues with this. Um, the first major issue is that um, this is a very high-dimensional integral in general. You know, we have a lot of parameters. Um, that includes the physical parameters that we care about, but all of the parameters describing the noise models and your instrument and, you know, all of those other kinds of things. So that's a really high-dimensional integral. And then there's another problem, and that other problem is that the I left off the normalization constant in my definition of the posterior probability, but it's this thing right here, which itself is another horrible high-dimensional integral that's outrageously hard to calculate. Um, and so uh, doing an integral over a probability distribution that's high-dimensional, that's normalized by an outrageously high-dimensional integral is uh, really not very fun. So we all use MCMC. So here's my best depiction of a probability distribution in Keynote. Um, and uh, this is a 2D probability distribution. These are contours. And for those of you who have used MCMC before, you've seen things like this. You start in some place in parameter space, and you have some iterative method for moving around the parameter space. Um, and it ends up looking something like that. And each time you make a proposal, you, uh, have, you compute some acceptance probability that looks a little something like that. This is rad because th it's a ratio, so the, the normalization constant cancels. That's, I, even if you don't know, like, those of you who use MCMC might not know that, but that's the reason why this is so awesome. Um, anyways, so, uh, so that, that's, that's what uh, MCMC is all about, and lots of people in here use it. I'm sure some of you even use MC, which is a package that I wrote, and it's pretty good um, for lots of things, um, and you should all use it. Um, but uh, today I'm going to talk about some other things and some reasons why MC might not be perfect for all of them. So let's start with this super scientific plot. Um, so here I'm, I'm plotting uh, sort of the computational cost of doing Bayesian data analysis as a function of the number of parameters that you have. And anyone who's used MC, MC before will know that this curve for MC looks exactly like that. Um, so as you get to, say, tens of parameters, you have to wait for weeks on a supercomputer to, for, your, for your MCMC to converge and to actually get a good sampling for your parameters. So really, you'd prefer something to be like this. You know, you're willing to wait a little bit longer, but you shouldn't have to um, wait the age of the universe to get the answer that you care about. And so that's the promise of HMC is that it's, it is better for high-dimensional problems. It scales better with um, the, the number of parameters. Now, so uh, I did a search on ADS um, for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, there are only 36 results. That might be because I'm just bad at ADS, but they make it pretty hard to be bad at it. Oh, look, it's me. Um, but, uh, um, but, 36 is not very many, given that I, there's all this promise. So why don't astronomers use this? And I'll get there in uh, just one second. Um, but uh, remember this picture right here. So I'll give you a very quick intro to uh, HMC. Um, so I didn't say anything about how we moved in this parameter space. So HMC is the same story as this. It looks like this. But at each step, when you're proposing a new point in the parameter space, you do lots of fancy things. And so basically, the story looks like this. So sometime the sort of historical accuracy might not be exact here. But sometime in the late 80s, some folks, quantum physicists, 
looked at a log probability that looked a little something like this. And uh, they maybe were looking at it upside down. And they realized that this looks exactly like a potential energy. Um, and you could imagine putting a particle in this, in this potential energy, giving it some momentum, and integrating it in this potential. Um, you have some Hamiltonian that looks like that. You know, it's, um, and so you've doubled the number of parameters. But we're all astronomers here, so we all know how to integrate numerically integrate dynamical systems. So you could imagine doing this. Now, the magic thing about HMC, oh, one, sorry, one thing I was going to say is, remember that point that I made about um, the acceptance probability always being this ratio of probabilities or the difference of log probabilities? What that means is that if you can integrate and conserve energy, then your acceptance probability will always be one because the change in, in the Hamiltonian will be the, the change in log probability. So that's sort of a, a more concrete reason for why that's, this is a good idea. Um, so the magic thing is that if you double the number of parameters that you're sampling with and do this crazy integration of the Hamiltonian, um, then it turns out that MCMC is easier, um, which isn't obvious, but uh, it is true. Now, um, so that's cool. But remember, you know, I said that not very many astronomers have used this, so why is that? And there are sort of two main problems. And the first one is, is the big one. So you might remember from the last time you were integrating dynamical systems that you know, if you do leapfrog integration or whatever, you have to compute the derivative of the potential with respect to the coordinates. And so here, remember that this is the derivative of the log probability with respect to the parameters. And if this log probability has a lot of physics built into it, then it might be pretty tedious to compute the, to like go through your code and compute the derivatives of everything with respect to the parameters. So that's the main reason why astronomers haven't used HMC very much, as far as I, I can tell. There are also a lot of tuning parameters. Um, it might not be obvious from the very quick description that I gave, but there's a lot of tuning parameters, and the, it tends to be quite sensitive to the setting of those parameters. And so I'm going to try to give very quickly uh, two pieces of advice for this uh, to how to how to deal with these two problems. So to deal with the first problem, you should this is the key word auto diff or automatic differentiation. Now basically it's super trivial. It's just your code is a bunch of operations. We know how to take the derivative of each of those operations. We know what the chain rule is. You just apply the chain rule. Um, now, in machine learning, this is called backpropagation because they always like to come up with fancy words for trivial things. Um, uh, but it's the same story. It's the reason why neural networks are a thing is because of automatic differentiation. Um, and so uh, it turns out that you know, we can do this very efficiently, even with lots of parameters, and love to chat about it later. Um, there are a bunch of different packages um, that you can use to do this in Python. Um, I won't go through them in detail here, but uh, I'm happy to chat about it later. And then for the second problem, um, you should, I said that there were lots of different tuning parameters, uh, but there's also a lot of literature and a lot of work done on building heuristics for how to tune those tuning parameters. And so you should use some existing implementation of all of those heuristics. Um, and so, uh, in particular, you want to use the no U-turn sampler with some sort of, uh, uh, I'll be done in one second. Um, and so the, the, the sort of two kids on the block for existing implementations are STAN, that looks a little bit like this, and PyMC3. There are probably others, so I apologize if I've left out your favorite, but um, these are sort of the two. Um, and to, the d distinction between the two is that STAN is, is like the gold standard. It has every feature. It's really amazing. Um, but it's really hard to hack and extend. And if you want to include some physical model inside of it, it can sometimes be hard to do that. PyMC3 is built on top of Python. It has more flexibility for actually extending and things like that. So I think that you should all uh, use PyMC3. Um, 
or had some plots, but that's fine. Um, I just wanted to point out that I've been blogging about learning how to use this. This is all brand new, and I just wrote a tutorial that's specifically for astronomers that you can find at GitHub on, on here for how to uh, use PyMC, uh, PyMC3. And thank you. Mm -hmm. Like Hamiltonians, um, it seems to rely on, on a conservation law. So what I'm wondering is, if you does it automatically do what in physics you would you would think of as uh, conserving angular momentum, for example, or are there other conservation or or would something analogous to conservation of angular momentum actually allow you to take this further? And you know, the more things you have that are conserved. Better the calculations would work. I'm guessing. That's a great question. I have absolutely no idea. Um, sorry. Um, uh, uh, I, I mean, there, there, there has been work on trying to e extend these methods to use more information about the problem and, and things like that. But um, I, I haven't heard it uh, phrased in terms of, of other cons conserved quantities. And I mean, of but, course, in the last Mm -hmm. you can find, and finding them to be difficult, the better it is for yeah. integration. That's, it's a really great, really great question. Yeah, yeah. No, I, and I bet there, I bet there is, there is some, there's, I'm sure there's some depth to that, that I, but I don't know the answer. I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah. So I was just uh, so I I didn't plant that. I promise. But um, so one example that I've been using this for is uh, fitting radial velocity exoplanets. When you have multiple planets, you have lots of parameters, and uh, this is super preliminary. But um, but uh, uh, here is an example where I've run many simulations where I simulate data sets, and then I'm uh, fitting those data sets using. MC, which is the blue line, and eight, uh, pi MC3, which is the orange line. And this is the cost per independent sample. So each sample in pi MC3 is, is much more expensive because you're integrating um, many steps uh, in your potential. Um, but the cost per independent sample is, is much lower. And it does seem to scale better with the number of parameters, although this isn't quite as extreme as the sketch that I drew earlier. So uh, it, it's still early days. Um, but again, we're only going up to 34 parameters here, and we're getting an order of magnitude speed up. Um, and this is a cute example because I have, you know, I have to solve Kepler's equation as part of this, and pi mc3 doesn't have support for solving that. So I had to extend it. And I've talked a little bit about that on my blog. Um, yeah, so so uh, I have been playing around with applying auto diff directly to um, n body integrations, um, and uh, there's the the sort of standard wisdom is that that's a bad idea because there will be numerical issues, um, but I don't think that that's been clearly demonstrated, and the performance should be better because if you integrate the variational equations, then uh, then the scaling is with the square of the number of, uh, of terms that you want to differentiate with respect to, whereas this auto diff should scale just with the number of outputs, which is one most of the time. So it should be better. It's a great question. Do you need this one too? Or?
All right. So it's really nice to be back. It's kind of exciting. And in the next 10 minutes, I would like to share with you some uh, recent developments in the field of superluminous supernovae and our attempt uh, to try and discover X-ray and radio emission from the superluminous supernovae. So what are those? They are very luminous supernovae, and they can be 100 times or even more sometimes more luminous than a normal supernova. And here are the questions that we are trying to solve are the easiest you can think about. So what is the energy source there? And which kind of star is able to produce this kind of uh, display? And if you go through the literature, you're going to find basically three main scenarios to explain superluminous supernovae. And the first is, uh, well, it's just like a supernova that interacts with a lot of stuff along the way. So it has the opportunity to convert a lot of kinetic energy into radiation. So you get uh, an improved efficiency uh, that way. Another possibility is uh, that they're just like normal supernovae, so normal fuel, but more of that. So more of nickel-56. And here uh, I put a, a light curve 87A and a scaled up version of it might be of our superluminous supernovae. Here, however, you run right, right away into a problem, which is that you need so much nickel that sometimes you need almost all of your ejecta to be made of nickel, and sometimes you need more nickel than your ejecta. So we have some issues here. A third uh, model is uh, a magnetar model. So here the main idea is that you put um, a source of energy in the middle of your ejecta, and then you come up with some creative ideas to extract this energy and put that into, back into radiation. So um, uh, these uh, three models, uh, uh, so in the literature, the first model, the interaction model, has been used a lot to explain supernovae with hydrogen. So it's pretty clear that some of the supernovae with hydrogen are indeed interacting. As I told you before, uh, the more ordinary fuel idea does not work uh, for most of the supernovae. So it turns out that if you want to study hydrogen strip superluminal supernovae, uh, the main and most popular scenario right now is this one, that we do have an extra energy source that is sitting in the middle of our ejecta. So uh, it seems that uh, superluminous supernovae, it seems to be engine-driven explosion, and there has been a number of, observational, uh, of observations that uh, sort of suggested this picture, and some of these uh, were actually uh, made here. So uh, from the study of the environments of these explosions, uh, Ragnild uh, Lunen here uh, said, well, they tend to happen as, uh, sort of in the same uh, place as gamma-ray burst supernovae. And those are the standard of engine during supernovae. Again, here, Matt Nichol pointed out that sometimes in superluminous supernovae, we do have UV excesses that can't be explained in any other way but, uh, uh, but using this extra energy source in the middle of the ejecta. And again, Matt showed that if you wait and you're patient, uh, if you wait long enough for the ejecta of your explosion to become transparent, and you start seeing the interiors of this star, well, the interiors of the superluminous supernovae, they look very much spectroscopically alike a gamma ray burst supernovae. So we do have all of this, um, uh, these observations that uh, support this idea of, yes, there might be an engine. But we didn't see the engine yet. So um, what I want to share with you is our search for X-rays and radio emission from the supernovae. And the first thing I want to uh, make it clear is why. So we have a stellar explosion, and stellar explosions are famous to put most of their radiation in the optical. So why do we, do we want to go there at the extremes of the spectrum? And here is the reason. So a good uh, way to think about a stellar explosion uh, is this one. Uh, the optically emitting material is telling you everything about the slowly moving stuff that carries most of the kinetic energy, but it's slowly moving. Instead, if you have a look at the X-rays and radio, this is the place uh, that carries a lot of information about the fastest ejecta in your explosion. So they, they trace the fastest moving material there, which means that if your explosion produces a jet, the X-rays and radio are the first place where you, you should start and, um, and look for it. Another thing that happened in the X-rays is that if you have a source that is sitting right in the, in the middle of the ejector here, th you can think about that as a light bulb that is ionizing the medium around. And at some point, this ionized material is going to become transparent to the X-rays. So at some point, this radiation uh, might be able to come out in what we, uh, we call an ionization breakout. 
Yet another thing that happens in the radio and X-rays is emission from the pulsar wind nebula may be inflated by this magnetar produced by the explosion. And yet uh, another re uh, reason which I find very, very interesting is that you can use the shock from this explosion to sample the environment, to learn about what the star was doing just before dying. And since we have no way to see directly the stars before death for this particular type of supernovae, this is the closest you get uh, to learning about uh, your stellar progenitors. So with uh, these uh, motivations, we embarked uh, in a survey of uh, uh, radio uh, emission from superluminous supernovae. And what you have here is the entire world of hydrogen stripped supernovae in the radio. And you have gamma ray bursts sitting up there, very luminous in the radio. You have normal supernovae here. And uh, uh, what I want you to appreciate is that at the beginning of our effort, the limits were here, and we were able to push it down a factor of 1,000. So we're really going very, very deep. So what did we conclude out of this effort? So first of all, let's concentrate on gamma ray bursts, so on jetted explosions. At the beginning, the first limits were not able to tell us if a gamma ray burst was there or not, so not even jets on axis. We could not say if those were there or not. Right now, uh, you can see that our deepest limits actually rule it out, not only on axis jets, but also these other curves, which are off axis jets. So we can say that um, off axis jets with the same uh, energy as gamma ray bursts are not there uh, for, for superluminous supernovae. Another important thing that we can say, comparing uh, the stars, the superluminous supernovae to uncollimated relativistic explosions like those one in blue, is that for the <laughs> deepest cases, that our deepest limits say, no, there is no uh, such a thing there. And the other thing that I find, um, that a lot of uh, my colleagues find interesting is that in the radio, superluminous supernovae are not superluminous at all. They're actually, they can be actually fainter than, than normal supernovae. So uh, we did the same thing in the X-rays. Uh, and uh, here you're looking at the world of hydrogen stripped explosions in the X-rays instead. Red is always for our superluminous supernovae. Gamma ray bursts are, uh, are up here. And here is where we started. And I want you to appreciate uh, that we started with these uh, limits and how deep we pushed is a, uh, is a huge factor there. So what did we learn uh, from the X-rays? So here, the main idea is the following, that if we produce a magnetar sitting inside the ejecta, at some point, depending on the properties of the ejecta, depending on the properties of your magnetar, you might be able to, to see radiation coming from, from the remnant. And when the magnetar is able to ionize the ejecta, you're going to have a burst of X-rays that can, in principle, get very, very luminous. And uh, the problem is all specified by these properties of the magnetar and the ejector around your explosion, which means that uh, if we do a good job and put our upper limits in this parameter space, we can actually learn about which kind of magnetar and which kind of ejector can be there. So if you do this exercise, you would conclude that you can afford this kind of parameters. So we, the, our observations point at kind of large ejector mass and large magnetic field, and this is totally consistent with what you would learn from the optical. So the other thing that you can learn uh, from the exercise I told you is um, what the star was doing just before death. And here the game is very simple. You use a shock as a probe of your environment, and your environment was shaped by your star before stellar death. So uh, we can use uh, the x-rays that we did not see, and the radio that we did not see, to, to learn about the density of this environment. So we did that, uh, and uh, we placed our superluminous supernova in this plot where you have a density of your environment versus the velocity of your fastest ejector. And here, the main takeaway point is that superluminous supernovae are in, tend to happen in low density environments. And again, this is consistent with what we are seeing for gamma ray bursts supernovae. So it seems that they do share something with engine-driven supernovae. They do not produce the same types of jets, though. <laughs> so here is where we are. Uh, so we think that uh, hydrogen strip superluminous supernovae, they are, uh, they are uh, powered by an engine. But this engine does not produce the same type of jets. However, the progenitor experiences something similar in terms of low uh, mass loss. 
So what about the future? So where do we go from here? So the future is this. I think uh, some Chandra people are going to be happy to hear that finally we detected something. <laughs> So I'm actually very excited to share it with you that this, uh, this is the first time we see rising X-ray emission from a superluminous supernova. So we do have a detection and the thing is rising and we are doing a very active campaign on this. And the other thing that is going to happen in the future is that we, are, we have an active search for pulsar wind nebula uh, signature with ALMA uh, from the uh, very uh, nearby superluminous supernovae. And if you just give me 30 seconds, I just want to tell you about something that I think is very exciting. We have a missing energy problem for superluminous supernovae, which is the following. It's very easy. So um, if you uh, predict, uh, if you try to model the light curve with a magnetar, optical light curve with, with a magnetar, you would predict uh, this kind of behavior in purple. Yet, what do we see, what we, saw, we see in the optical is this. So uh, we thought, well, maybe uh, this type of this amount of energy is coming out maybe in the X-rays. Maybe that's the place where it is coming out. And um, Ryan Chorank and students, uh, they did this exercise of trying to go and see where this energy is emitted. And here are the limits in the X-rays. So we can say that it's not emitted in the X-rays. Uh, and you, can, you have two choices. Either we abandon the magnetar and say, well, no, nope, no thanks. Or Maybe this is leaking out like in the hard X-rays or in the gamma rays, and that is where we're going to look for this kind of missing energy problem. And this is it. I want to thank all of you, and especially the Chandra people, for giving us all of this time for 16 photons so far. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's like uh, two months. Yeah. And we have another Chandra observation planned. I don't think there is nothing wrong with the black hole, but the magnetar has the beauty that you can easily parameterize uh, the, the luminosity that you expect uh, in terms of magnetic field and, and, uh, and spin power and uh, spin. And so it, it's, I think it's a, it's a better defined uh, model to compute. But I've, to rule out. I don't think it's that easy to rule out, actually, because I'm, I'm really trying hard uh, to. to <laughs> <laughs> But you need a, a long lived end zone compared to what you see in the back of the Because of the duration here, it's significantly longer. So if it's a black hole, you should be able to. You need to accrete a lot, yeah. 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 But I'm sure you can come up with a, a way to make the black hole accrete for long, right? <laughs> yeah, you can do it. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, so I've, I've used this really obnoxious high horse title uh, intentionally. That's not meant to anger anyone or be unfair. And I'm happy with being accused of being provocative, but I definitely don't want to be accused of being unfair. And so I'm actually going to begin uh, this talk by defending uh, the GRE, just for in case you're not from the U.S. or you, you, haven't, no, you don't know, the, the GRE, the Graduate Record Examination, is a standardized exam that's required by many, many astronomy, physics, STEM, PhD programs throughout the United States. And I'm going to defend it um, for, you know, about a, a couple of minutes. Um, so, so for the people who actually work in this field, this paper, which came out a couple, uh, about a month ago, has made a huge splash and made a lot of people very angry and caused a lot of noise in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, it's by Sandra Peterson, who's a lovely researcher at, at UMass Amherst. 
Um, the paper found with a, a, an unusually large study for this, this sort of study, um, 1,800 students, um, that, uh, the, the, that students with the lowest GRE score were more likely to finish their PhD. This is among four <laughs> flagship institutions. Careful. Okay, you know, okay, that's fine. Um, four, four flagship R1 institutions. Um, 18,000, uh, um, a cohort of 18,000 people enter a STEM PhD every year. About 60% of them will ultimately make it to their PhD. So 40 there's a 40% attrition rate. There's a whole industry in understanding the, the many intersectional factors that might couple to that attrition rate. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's a long story, but, um, it, it turns out that, that at least for these institutions, at least among this range restricted, reasonably low number statistics sample, um, the, the, the people who got the worst scores on their GRE were more likely to finish. So that caused a lot of people at the Educational Testing Service who administers, administers the exam to be very angry and to be totally fair to them. They make good arguments, right? Um, so this is David Payne, the CEO of ETS, the uh, Educational Testing Service. And he says very emphatically that the GRE does not predict graduate or doctoral completion rates. It was never meant to do this. It is only a proxy for preparation for a graduate degree program. The physics GRE is meant only to be a proxy for preparation, not for success or completion or anything like that, for a graduate degree program, right? So you have to be careful. The, the, you have to make a leap that is not necessarily warranted between preparation and you know, potential for success in a physics program. You could imagine a mathematician coming into an astronomy PhD program, not knowing what a redshift is, and becoming a really brilliant astronomer, right? Preparation does not necessarily mean potential for future success. I've spoken with David Payne. He's a lovely, reasonable, um, well-intentioned human being. Um, the, the Educational Testing Service, you could give a whole talk on it. They've come out very strongly in recent years because there's been a movement away from the GRE. Harvard's dropped the GRE. Um, many, many major flagship institutions have dropped the GRE. And so they're fighting back, right? Um, they're fighting back, um, making good, solid, reasonable arguments. Look, I, I could flip this around and give a nasty talk about the ETS, um, not necessarily calling it an evil organization, but just pointing out that their annual revenue is a billion dollars for a nominally nonprofit organization, and their CEO makes more than the president of Harvard. I could say that, but, <laughs> but to be absolutely fair to the ETS, a lot of the arguments they make are totally reasonable. Here are two of them. Um, there's some evidence, this study is a little bit weak, um, that test optional programs uh, do not see an increase in diversity among their applicant pools. Another argument is that standardized exams actually level the playing field, do the opposite of what you might think, um, and can combat both implicit and prestige biases. The, the idea being that if you have an applicant from Harvard and an applicant from you know, a, a community college, for example, um, that you know, an equal or a better GRE score from the applicant from the community college can actually fight against this you know, brand name recognition for the applicant from Harvard, right? Fair enough. Um, so a, a while ago, uh, some friends and I, Emily Levesque, Rachel Bizanson, and I wrote this paper that got a lot of email. Not as much email as your paper's <laughs> generating, but we got a lot of email. I still get a lot of email about this dumb paper. Um, and... and uh, of all the email that we got, we got some really, really interesting pushbacks, and I want to give them due credit. And one of those was from a famous R1 professor at a famous um, university who said that if you drop the, the physics GRE, committees will just rely on another proxy. Fair enough. The one, another one we got was, if you drop the physics GRE, applicants from China and India will have no way to distinguish themselves. There is an entire industry in China of acing the physics GRE. Get, you, you get a perfect score on the physics GRE. That is the way you distinguish yourself in an application to, say, for example, the Harvard Astronomy PhD program. I, I don't know. What, fair enough. You know? um, OK, but there are things we can all agree on, right? Um, selecting from a fabulous applicant pool is really, really hard, right? There is no committee member. I, I'm going to posit that all of these committee members and the Harvard committee are all good, well-intentioned people. Um, and they have to do awful tasks, right? To the Hubble Fellowship Program last year, there were 350 applicants for 24 fellowships, right? That means 93% of your applications must be rejected somehow, right? Um, it, there's a, the, the big buzzword nowadays is holistic admissions, right? The opposite of a holistic admissions process where it's, say, there are faculty applications 
um, to, to Harvard. Edo and, and Ramesh and, and John, for example, are, are reviewing the applications and they take their spreadsheet and they sort their applicants on H index and descending order and they make their offer to the first, to the top ranked person on H index, right? That's the exact opposite of a holistic process. The, the, the other end of that spectrum would be truly knowing this applicant as a human being, as a scientist, uh, truly understanding their potential. And we must admit that that is really hard to do from a three-page research statement, a CV, and some letters of recommendation, right? Um, so I think we can all agree you know, that a truly holistic application process, while a great ideal, is very difficult to actually implement on a committee, especially when you have something like 300 applications. Also, be remembered that, weirdly, there's very little data about the GRE's efficacy, positive or negative, and that we're all good statisticians. Hopefully, you have to be very careful about how you weight your data in these studies. One of the major effects is range restriction, right? If I take a plot of, of Harvard undergrads and plot their high school GPA versus their SAT scores, there's almost certainly going to be no correlation, right? Because they already have great SAT. I, well, I don't actually know if Harvard requires the SAT, but you know what I mean, right? If I plot um, uh, height versus athletic ability, but restrict it to um, you know, uh, newborns, Right? You're not going to get really good data, right? And, and just for the same reason, if, if you're trying to do a study of success in graduate school and GRE scores, right, you're already selecting, uh, you're already working among a, a, a sample that has already been selected to survive any cutoff there might be or any weight there might be on the physics GRE. Okay? Keep that in mind. The data is terrible here, awful. Um, and then th there's no doubt that GRE scores almost certainly correlate with many manifold things, right? And some of those things we might actually care about. Maybe the GRE is a good predictor, at least in some way of, of you know, success in graduate school or potential as a scientist. I don't know, right? Okay, finally I'm getting to this. Um, it, it just remember that, that although it, it certainly correlates with many things, it probably also correlates with things that we don't want to select on. This is the SAT, it's not the GRE but you probably will get the same thing. SAT, in a statistically significant way, correlates with socioeconomic status of the test taker's parents. Okay? Um, th there are a lot of confounders here. Maybe it's parental education level that's partially driving this. Who knows? But keep it in mind. Um, but we can also agree that there's clearly a problem, right? I probably don't need to convince this audience that talent, it is, talent is distributed equally, but opportunity is most certainly not. Certainly not in this country, right? I could give, you could give an entire talk on this. I'll give three slides on it, which is not doing it justice. But for example, in our country, um, it, school funding is very often coupled to property taxes, right? Which is why, I, I, so I live in Brookline. Um, this is a, a, a selection from the Brookline High School course catalog. The Brookline High School actually <laughs> offers a course on the foods of provincial France. My, <laughs> Really, I, I grew up in Maine. My, my high school didn't have a calculus class. Um, but, uh, you know, look, okay. Um, but, but at the same, so this is from their 2016 course catalog. This photo was taken in Baltimore in January of 2018, right? I, so, okay. Um, and then just, just to keep this in perspective from our, from our own local neighborhood, right? The, the median uh, net worth of a black family in Boston is $8.00 not a typo, um, while the median for a, for a white family is $247,000. So those are just three little like, tableaus to keep in mind as we, as we go forward here. Um, so uh, uh, it is absolutely true, just pure data, that among uh, STEM fields, physics and astro are some of the worst sufferers of URM underrepresentation. Uh, there's physics here. Um, this is all data from APS. Uh, there's physics. Um, this is all physics. So these lines are the, per, the, the, the representation of the population of this subgroup. And then these are the actual um, percentage of total physics degrees. I'm going to quickly move on, because um, I actually want to get to what I'm talking about. Um, but my argument for the GRE, then, is, is nothing super controversial. Right? And, and I, I think that the people uh, that are, are in this camp are also not actually being that controversial, even though this has caused a lot of controversy. Um, this is all data directly from the ETS itself. right? So this is the GRE quantitative score for different subgroups, Asians, whites, other Hispanics, Mexicans. Okay? Um, so there is a, a very, very clear underperformance 
of certain subgroups relative to others, right? This is a systematic effect. This is, this is 20,000 test takers in this, in this data set alone. Um, here it is another way, 20,000 exam takers. If you control for the undergraduate GPA, so all of these students have a GPA equivalent to an A, the, the effect persists, right? So that's about 15,000 students in that one. Um, and yet, uh, uh, there are a large number, even still, this was larger about four years ago. Um, th these numbers are actually from, from 2015. Uh, but, um, you know, 20, so most, most require the general G GRE. Um, uh, 25 percent of these have an explicit cutoff, some of them with a median being around 700. And uh, 48 percent of physics and astronomy PhD programs, that number's a little lower today, um, require the, the physics GRE with about half of those explicitly stating a cutoff. And my argument is explicitly against the cutoff, not necessarily even against use of the GRE as one factor in an application. But it is a fact that at least three flagship astronomy PhD programs will not read your application if your physics GRE score is below 70th percentile. That is a fact. I can, Harvard is not one of them. I don't know if, I don't know what Harvard does. Harvard's not one of those, but okay. So keep that in mind. Um, and, and then look around at all of your friends and think of the panoply of beautiful research that you've all done and all of your life story as a scientist and, and, and truly, truly think back as to whether or not this three hour long multiple choice exam that you took when you were 21 years old on a fall Saturday is at all predictive of your potential as a future scientist, right? Um, I, I just wanted to show you, you have about 90 seconds to answer each of these questions. Uh, I got the last two wrong, definitely. This, some of them are reasonable, right? Some of them, they look a little bit intimidating, but this is just a pure dimensional analysis problem. This one, I have no idea. Um, the answers are down there, by the way. Anyway, um, the effects of the cutoffs are real, right? So I'm, I'm, I have one more minute, I promise. Um, uh, I, I, I will blow through this, these very important plots and I apologize, but I've drawn the cutoffs that are real cutoffs and you can see what you're doing to your applicant pool as you draw these real, very, very real cutoffs, right? Um, so you are, you are systematically down selecting your black applicants and uh, your female applicants, right? By, by implementing a cutoff. Um, and this is my little provocative slide. If you argue for a cutoff in your application pool, then you implicitly agree that your performance on a three-hour multiple choice exam is an excellent, not just a proxy, an excellent proxy for your future as a scientist, right? Mm -hmm. You also implicitly agree, whether you think you are or not, that the GRE is such a useful proxy that it is worth risking introducing an explicit, an explicit selection on sex and, and skin color among your applicant pool. That is what you're doing, okay? And there is absolutely zero evidence for this, right? Notice I haven't shown any plots or, or whatever showing that the GRE actually shows some evidence that it's predictive of, of success, right? And I definitely can't show a plot that unambiguously shows that, right? And my point is, um, okay, there is a small but growing collection of range-restricted, low number statistic anic data, if you want. Um, that, that suggests that the GRE is not actually predictive of, of things we care about, right? This is first author papers in graduate school. This is from our paper. There's anic data here, right? So there was a, there was a, 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 a graduate student who wrote 13 first author papers in graduate school, which is unheard of. So it's like a seven sigma outlier who got an 11% on the GRE. Okay, look, this is anic data. It's worth noting, but... Um, but my point is that the burden of proof should be on the exam. Right? If you're going to make people jump through all of these hoops, why is it on me to show that the GRE is not predictive of success? Shouldn't you be the one showing that the GRE is predictive? Right? Um, and considering this, I think that we should drop the GRE based on these, this plot alone. Just this plot alone, because there is no evidence to suggest that it's worth risking in explicitly applying this selection to your applicant pool based off of the available evidence for the GRE. And that's all I've got. Um, there is James, James Gillishan has, has, has collected a, a list of, of all the programs that require or not uh, the GRE. Um, it's updated every day because there's this, been this big movement toward dumping the GRE. Um, and you can just find, find it by uh, Googling Gillishan GRE. Thanks, and sorry for going over. <laughs> Thank you.
one question for that quick. <laughs> I'm sorry, I went way over. I, 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 well, I hope you're going to make all of this available online. Sure. Great thoughts. But the quick question has to do with um, the various types of GREs. So yeah. I noticed some of you said general, yeah. and others you were saying physics. Can yes. You just say one or two sentences yes. Whether these results yeah. So this is this is called from a longer talk that used to exist. I, I was completely lumping in the general and physics GRE in, into the same discussion. They're they're very different exams, um, uh, and so there there are these plots have been broken out for the physics GRE, um, but I have lumped together the general GRE. Um, I've also lumped SAT talks, you know, uh, plots in here. Um, so. Uh, uh, the data is really low, right? There aren't that many test takers for the physics GRE every year, um, and so it's it's easier to to have statistically significant or meaningful results from the general GRE test taking population um, because there just aren't many physics GRE takers every year. Um, yeah.